We were supposed to start on time. We're already a couple of minutes behind, so I think we'll get going. Uh, the topic today is the future of healthcare, the future of healthcare in Alberta. I'm Stan Houston. Um, I'm a Parkland board member uh, representing the University of Alberta, and I work in the uh, Alberta healthcare system. So, are you ready, Heather? <laughs> Just about? <laughs> just about. Just um, There are handouts on both ends of the uh, coming in, so you may not have gotten them. Um, hello, I'm Heather Smith. I'm uh, president of United Nurses of Alberta, and I'm... Oh, oh maybe I didn't turn oh, oh, it on. Okay. Now you can't? Yeah, okay. Heather's, Heather's originally uh, from Ontario, but she's been in Alberta for... Wow. ages uh, and is the uh, president of UNA, the United Nurses of Alberta. She's also the recipient of the Spirit of Tommy Douglas Award, which I think speaks a lot for her um, attitude and her contribution to uh, health care. Thank you, Stan. And I acknowledge that uh, we are meeting, gathering here on uh, Treaty 6 territory and, and thank the First Peoples of this land for their hospitality today. Um, yeah, Stan mentioned I originally am from Ontario. I left Ontario a couple of days after graduating from uh, nursing school and I've lived in Alberta ever since. Um, my involvement with healthcare wasn't, hasn't been just because of my profession, uh, certainly my profession has, I think, uh, added or been a big part of it, but uh, my involvement with uh, advocating uh, for Medicare uh, began in the um, early 80s, actually. I was uh, one of the people who uh, was part of presentations, part, took part in presentations to Monique Bejin uh, many years ago prior to the Canada Health Act and have just continued on primarily with uh, advocacy groups such as Friends of Medicare, uh, Public Interest Alberta, and even uh, Parkland. Uh, so what I what thought we'd do today, and I want to start by saying kind of I'm a fraud, uh, in that um, the real wealth of materials on healthcare um, and information about healthcare um, are abundant, and I'm drawing on some of those resources and giving you some of those resources, again, from organizations such as Public Interest Alberta, Friends of Medicare, the Canadian Health Coalition, the, uh, some from the, uh, there's even materials that I've used from the uh, Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives, uh, and um, the Council of Canadians. There's a huge wealth of information out there about uh, Medicare and threats to Medicare. And the ones I'm going to talk are the, the, I've decided to sort of talk or restrict my talk to sort of what I call the hot spots. And the first hot spot in healthcare today is one of opportunity, actually, and that is around a national pharmacare program. And so I do have materials here um, specific to, to Pharmacare, but I want to step back, actually, one step here. The importance of the healthcare system we have in Canada uh, was recently reinforced for me uh, in late September, actually. We were, UNA, United Nurses of Alberta, was host to a delegation of nurses from the United States. Um, they were here sort of on a fact-finding mission. Uh, they're from the, a group called the National uh, Nurses United, which in the American context, for people who might know Canadian equivalent, would, Canadian equivalent would be the Canadian Federation of Nurses Unions, which my provincial union is also a part of. So it's an American national um, union uh, for nurses and they are they are from my understanding they are pivotal and and certainly the primary uh, group behind a, um, a national campaign in the United States for health called health care for all and so they were here to look at our health care system uh, we were one of three cities that they came to. We had a group here in Edmonton, a group went to Saskatoon, and another group went to Toronto. 
And uh, what was interesting about their visit um, <laughs> was that when we were preparing the itinerary with them, one of the things they specifically asked to see was the billing floor. And what they were talking about, and when they came and met with, in the United States, from their experience, it's not uncommon to have a whole floor in a hospital dedicated to billing, per, for billing purposes. So we sort of said, well, you know, there may be a room somewhere where people can go to, you know, if they're paying for crutches or something like that, but we, do, we don't have that. And certainly Alberta Health Services has some billing facility uh, somewhere, but I mean, it's not, it's not part of what we would consider, um, you know, our everyday healthcare system. Another thing that was interesting about their visit was we actually uh, had a f we toured uh, had a tour of the university hospital with them, and they were particularly interested in the critical care area, in the equipment, and some of them were critical care nurses, and they were commenting that wow this is this is just like we would have in a acute care hospital because the <laughs> the rumor that they brought to the table in our discussions was that in Canada, one of the myths is that in Canada, they don't have access to the same kind of technology that the world-class private system gives them in the United States. So it was really helpful in terms of reminding us, uh, reminding me of the value of what we have when I'm talking to colleagues from across the border who are fighting desperately, working desperately to try to change the system that they have. So one of the things that is happening right now and we talked about with them um, is Pharmacare. And I think we are closer to actually achieving Pharmacare than we have ever been in, in our history. Uh, Pharmacare was always meant by the father of uh, Medicare in terms of Thomas Douglas. Medi Pharmacare was always meant to be part of it and there's all kinds of stats and information uh, in terms of, you know, Canada is the only country with universal Medicare that doesn't include prescription drugs. But it looks like uh, we may actually achieve Pharmacare in the not too distant future. And when I say that, I'm thinking, you know, ideally it should have been implemented years ago, but we could potentially be looking at moving to a full plan, I think, within five years if the federal government uh, follows through with the uh, current initiatives around Pharmacare. So there's all kinds of stuff uh, out there in terms of Pharmacare. Um, there's a couple of uh, reports that I particularly would pull out to your attention. Uh, one is uh, down the drain, which I had here, but it's a publication from 2016, uh, actually uh, sponsored by or paid for, uh, commissioned by the Canadian Federation of Nurses Unions. And what down the drain, uh, and this was uh, authored by uh, Hugh McKenzie, and what down the drain suggested was that between 2006 and 2015, that we had literally flushed about uh, $62 billion down the drain. And the reason that the 2006 date was chosen in terms of looking at costs was that it was in 2004, so 14 years ago, 2004, that the premiers unanimously uh, called for a universal national pharmacare program. So we've been working at trying to push uh, since that time, since we had a commitment from the premiers, all of the premiers, uh, to push the federal government to actually implementing a Pharmacare plan. Um, just on that, another publication by, again, uh, commissioned by CFNU is something called Body Count. And in Body Count, it suggests that between 320 and 640 people die unnecessarily every year of ischemic heart disease, that between 2070 and 420 uh, diabetic-related uh, uh, mortalities occur, again, preventable, that between 550 and 670 uh, premature deaths uh, occur uh, because of shortfalls in coverage, and 
between around 70,000 people. And I was looking at what's 70,000 people and I was you know, trying to put, that's close to the, the population of uh, Fort Mac, Grand Prairie, a whole city. But about 70,000 people a year, uh, 55 and over, suffer avoidable deterioration in their health status. And it also suggests that 12,000 people 40 plus uh, with cardiovascular disease require overnight hospitalizations. I'm saying this because all of this adds to other costs in, in the system. Um, and so I have given you material specific to the Pharmacare initiatives uh, across Canada. There are uh, a couple of things. One thing I've given is the Pharmacare consensus principles. These came out in October and what this is, it's very easy to understand in the list of organizations on the back who support it. But this is what we are saying a Pharmacare universal pharmacare plan should look like. Um, universal, universality, public single, single payer administration, accessibility, comprehensive and portable coverage. It's really an important moment in time for pharmacare because there is a real battle going on and I know some people here may have been part of the uh, hearings that have been held across Canada, but there are two poles in this debate. Uh, one can be characterized by the pharmaceuticals and the insurance companies. And the pharmaceuticals and the insurance companies, as opposed to these principles, suggest that we just need a, a top-up, fill-in-the-gap uh, pharmacare program for those who uh, aren't old, aren't young, um, aren't uh, you know, part of workplace uh, benefit plans already. So a fill in the gap versus a universal program. They also uh, would suggest to you that you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with, with co-payments and that kind of stuff. What we are calling for is a full meal, whole meal deal in terms of a universal plan that has no co-payments, and I equate co-payments to the user fees we saw uh, existed uh, when with, and we had to challenge under the Canada Health Act. So I'm calling for no copay, no band-aid, and level up, le not level down, which means that, because a lot of people do have coverage already, and when we're talking about a universal plan that's going to encourage and support, that we have to be talking about the highest common denominator, not the lowest common denominator in terms of cash. Um, there's a, a publication that uh, exists, and it's actually attributed to um, Steve Morgan, who is a professor at the University of um, U of BC, he's in the School of Public uh, Pop, uh, School of Population and Public Health, and it's very concise in terms of the four reasons that we should have a Medicare Pharmacare no, Universal Pharmacare Plan. First, he says because the World Health Organization uh, has already. Uh, identified, and I believe this goes back to 2003, that access to essential medicines is a human right, that a uh, pharmacare program would save lives, um, that there are three to five times, that Canadians are three to five times more likely to skip prescriptions because of costs. He says it will save billions is the third reason. We know that and the various, various publications have different numbers, but they're all uh, way up there in the billions in terms of how much we would save. Um, and that the last one is to, it would help Canadian business. And I think this is really important. Um, this is part of the reason the insurance companies um, are opposed to a universal plan, because they make huge profits out of the insurance uh, benefits that they sell to employers and that employers and employees usually cost a cost share. So that's the kind of story on Pharmacare. And I would encourage you, uh, it's really easy, there's lots of petitions and stuff out there in terms of supporting a universal Pharmacare. I encourage you when you go to a website to be careful uh, because certainly there is at least one website that is uh, from the insurance companies um, and when you first see it, it says asks you to sign on to this petition, but unless you go into what they're actually saying Saying, uh, you don't know that they're calling for a, an affordable plan. 
clearly if we're going to save billions of dollars, it's affordable. But they're, what they're calling is an affordable plan that is basically the topping up. Um, so I encourage you to just Google Canada Pharmacare petitions, and you'll see stuff there from the Canadian Health Coalition. Uh, the Canadian Labour Congress has a huge campaign that's been going on in terms of uh, pharma a Pharmacare plan for everyone. Um, the Canadian Health Coalition, the Canadian Federation of Nurses Unions, there's all sorts of good petitions out there that I encourage you to sign on to in terms of saying that, yes, we want, it's, it's long overdue uh, a national pharmacare system. The other thing that I would point out, if you have haven't seen it at the Friends of Medicare table. They have all kinds of resources on Pharmacare as well. There's an app, the Mythbuster, which I hadn't seen before um, from the, the uh, Canadian Health Coalition, but there's all kinds of great materials. The other thing I want to touch on, and I'll be quick, I don't know how long we have here, but it's uh, the, the other big issue for me in healthcare right now is, is seniors, seniors care. And again, I've provided you uh, some information uh, about seniors care or seniors issues, and I know from some of the faces in this room, including John and Larry and um, my friends here, that there's all kinds of experts in this room around the issues of uh, seniors care. Um, and there's a whole lot of really positive recommendations. PIA uh, has a, a seniors task force, which Carol and John here are also part of, and, and John here. Um, and there have been very clear recommendations that have come from Public Interest Alberta in terms of what is wrong with the current system and what we need. Um, this yellow sheet, it's, uh, is basically, it's, it's taken, as I said, I'm proud, this is taken from, from PIA, um, and it's a result of a lot of work by a lot of people who are very concerned in this area, and one of the biggest issues we have is capacity. Uh, because of what happened to us uh, throughout the years and an intentional move to shed uh, responsibility for primarily cost, uh, from governments um, and uh, the, uh, the Alberta Health Services, but primarily government, because the money for Alberta Health Services come from, comes from government. But this predates it. This goes back really to the late 1980s, uh, developing a vision for seniors' care in particular, which relie would relieve government of financial burdens and responsibilities. And what we've had since then is a series of uh, political decisions, including not building capacity for true uh, long-term care. Uh, long-term care in Alberta means a specific thing. It means nursing home levels of care. And we've actually, uh, over the years and even in, in recent years, we've had a, a loss of public beds um, and an explosion of other than uh, nursing home beds as part of this moving the responsibility for payment and care away from, from government entities. And there's all kinds of information that, that exists around that topic as well, and I'm sure people here will want to get uh, have some discussion about it. But uh, there's that, and uh, I just would highlight again in terms of hope, because um, we in the Medicare advocate, advocacy community have been calling for the expansion of the Medicare umbrella uh, for many, many years. Um, expanding it to include things like pharmacare and comprehensive home care, having a, a, a full senior strategy, in, including seniors care, because as we've shifted and closed beds in what might have, you know, like auxiliary hospitals and stuff, uh, we have done a huge disservice to not only seniors but other vulnerable populations who need that kind of level of care. So there is a new initiative coming from the Canadian Health Coalition, um, ensuring quality care for all seniors. It's this one. I'm not going to go through it. It's easy to read. The recommendations are very, very uh, clear to understand. But it's because uh, the changes in long-term care, in seniors' care over the decades has really resulted in a national crisis. It's not just an issue here in Alberta, it's an issue right across Canada and 
just as with PharmaCare, it's time we took action on it. The last set of comments I'm going to make is sort of around what I'm calling threats, and I'll be very quick on this one as well. Um, in healthcare, uh, certainly there's a lot of chatter right now that at least one individual seeking premiership of this province um, has a vision that would undermine incredibly the work that has been built, uh, the work that uh, groups like PIA has done in terms of trying to make the public aware and push for, for changes that are, are humane in terms of care. Um, suggestions that you can cut slash the Alberta health or slash health funding by 20% would have decimating results um, on our healthcare system. Remember, this is a man who suggests that Ralph Klein didn't go far enough in his day, and we're still climbing out of, of that hole, really, because uh, you ask what's happening in Alberta hospitals today in overcapacity. We just do not have capacity, and we can only push so much out uh, into community, and there's, of course, always the threats of uh, if it goes outside of a hospital, uh, who's going to be responsible for the payment. But it's not just the suggestion that we could have a 20% cut in health funding. The other big threat uh, in terms of that particular individual is his notions around deregulation. Most people do not know that in healthcare, there is no real standard law with respect to staffing. Uh, in the only piece of legislation we have, other than the Hospital Act, the only reference to staffing in the Hospital Act is that there must be adequate, whatever that may mean. The only real floor we have is actually in the Nursing Home Act, which says there must be, in the, and this is in the regulations, which is why this is an important comment. In the regulations, not in the Nursing Home Act, but in the regulations, there is a requirement for 1.9 hours of care. Uh, this was set in the 80s. Uh, most literature now would say that it should be 4.1, 4.5. I believe PIA, our recommendation was 4.1. So ours says 1.9 hours of care, and of that, 22% of that must be RN. The Nursing Home Act regu regulations, again, would require a nurse, uh, a registered nurse 24-7 in long-term care in nursing home facilities. Uh, the gentleman I spoke of um, has recently um, been heard, directly heard, to say that he would appoint a minister solely, tasked solely with decreasing regulations by one third. We have ha previously had attacks or suggestions of changes to the Nursing Home Act regulations, which we pushed back against and we stopped uh, the changes that were proposed then. But there is a real fear amongst healthcare advocates that with a, a minister tasked with deregulation, uh, the purpose of the deregulation would be to uh, create financial stimulus in our economy, that we would, instead of moving forward in terms of achieving appropriate amounts of care uh, by skilled providers and by skilled providers that we would actually lose the very floor we now have. So um, again, I would suggest that an austerity uh, approach, uh, a focus on deregulating a system that hardly has any regulations in it already uh, would be a huge step backward for, for healthcare, uh, Medicare in our province. So that's all I'm going to say. So Heather, I'm uh, wondering whether the condition of your uh, senior sign over there maybe reflects the state of seniors' care in the in the province. It suggests that that uh, gorilla tape isn't as strong as it's supposed to be. So uh, the next speaker is uh, uh, an in-house um, uh, individual. Uh, uh, Rebecca Graf McRae is, is one of the uh, highly productive uh, research manager, managers. Uh, in um, in Parkland, 
Um, she is originally Albertan, but she got uh, her um, graduate education in uh, Belfast in Northern Ireland. And she tells me that in that uh, uh, studying that conflict situation was very good preparation for uh, working here in Alberta. All right, thank you. Have I got this on? Yeah, grand, thanks. Sorry about that, guys. Um, I am going to... Oh, so after uh, having to follow Heather is a pretty, a pretty difficult uh, uh, task for anybody, but I'm going to shift the focus a little bit more to zero in a bit on specifically on the last three and a half years of healthcare in Alberta. I try to give a broad picture of what's been achieved under the Notley NDP government and, and where the sort of big missed opportunities um, have been. So um, I just kind of start by prefacing some of this. I mean, we all know how, how I'm hoping this works. Uh, wrong button. There we go. Sorry. So there we go. This is one of my favorite headlines from uh, May of 2015. You know, in the wake of our, uh, the NDP's historic election victory and, and the sort of like the, the, the sheer unexplainedness of it all, how could a socialist party take over the Texas of Canada? Well, we heard very much from, from Janet Brown this morning that maybe we're not quite as Texan as we always liked to think. Um, but part of this, um, this, this sheer sort of shock of this, the, what do we do now and, and what does this mean for Alberta? Um, was really reflected in these, these kinds of um, responses in the media and from pundits. Uh, and they were all sort of left scrambling around for some kind of analogy, a comparison. Are we Texas? Are we communist China? I don't know. Um, and, and often uh, the pundits in particular were sort of scrambling for past parallels on which they could anchor um, a sense of certainty about what was going to be coming ahead. Um, and often this took, took shape in relying on traditional cliches about NDP governments in particular, um, or comparisons uh, to previous NDP administrations in other provinces. So on the left, um, you got the NDP sort of traditionally characterizing itself as the, the, the party of the founders of Medicare, um, the inheritors of its legacy. It's, Fair, but although I do think there's only one person who can officially claim the mantle of Tommy Douglas in this room because she won the award, that's Heather. Um, but so we see here, now I, I know it's a bit small print there, but that does say John Conway, not John Carpe. Um, you just want to be really clear about my sources, all right? Um, and again, so we hear from uh, Jack Layton in 2011. I think most people know that New Democrats are fierce defenders of our public health care system, right? or even going all the way back to Alan Blakeney in uh, Saskatchewan, the Saskatchewan NDP Premier in 1986, uh, his re-election campaign slogan, let's do it for Tommy. Right? So um, the, this hearkening back to Tommy Douglas and what his, what his legacy might mean for healthcare, an integral part of NDP parties generally. On the other hand, we have from the right, um, these sort of, um, very facile comparisons, and they're meant to be insulting. You know, from the Toronto Sun, not least choice, Romano or Ray. It's very much uh, invoking, I don't know, Sophie's choice here, so it's not quite that dire. Um, and, and the Fraser Institute, our dear friends there, they answered the question themselves, as they like to do without any evidence, um, and they said, nope, she's clearly Bob Ray 2.0. Uh, or this one from the Edmonton Sun, like the NDP everywhere, it cannot be satisfied. No amount of tax dollars will ever be enough. Uh, so these broad assumptions based either on, on traditional characterizations or on cherry picking um, particular interpretations of NDP government's past. Um, so the fact though is that the, it, or, the reality that these claims are just thrown out there as though there's some, some basis in fact. 
and, and whether the, this is um, from the right or the left. Uh, and this is sort of what led us at Parkland and some of our, our network to kind of ask that question is, you know, how much, how much real meat is there to, to the cliche, to the stereotype on either side? So um, wanting to ask ourselves, where is this evidence? Are NDP governments the real, in practice, uh, champions for our public health care system? Are they, have they been, as their opponents would claim, really poor fiscal managers? Are they bad at stewarding the economy? Do they always tax and run up deficits? These, again, these are things that are thrown around as though we, sh we just accept them. Um, when what we found was that there are very few empirical studies uh, in, into any of this, looking specifically at NDP governments in a comparative um, perspective. Um, so a few years ago, <clears throat> I won't tell you how many, but a few years ago, we took it upon ourselves at Parkland to um, put together a study of all the past NDP governments across five provinces. Um, we kind of picked a time frame, but anything going on from 1990 onward. Here we go. Oh, I missed this one because I was talking. You guys will enjoy this one. <laughs> Socialism with a smiling face. So we like uh, that. But of course, yes, yes. Coming from Lauren Gunter, we, we take that as given. So what we wanted to determine by looking at these five governments was whether these are helpful parallels or baseless comparisons. I randomly found this through the Google machine. I'm like, overnight, somehow, we turned into Saskatchewan under Romano. And I'm not sure how that happened. Uh, drunk Irish baby tells us that it's true. <laughs> I can only say that because I'm an Irishman. Um, so what we wanted to dig into were the nuances of this, because we know not all NDP governments are equal. We know that governments respond more to, to the pressing challenges for their province, for their region, what circumstances are happening nationally and internationally at the time, and that they take different positions based on pragmatism and incrementalism or based on radical change um, and, and ideology. And also, they have to work within my boss's favorite saying, the Overton window, right? What is politically possible at any given time? So how, how possible is it to make generalizations about those governments? So these were the five that we looked at. Uh, British Columbia from 1990 to 2000, three NDP premiers there. Uh, Saskatchewan from 91 to 2007, under Romano and Calvert. Uh, Manitoba from 99 to 2016, under Dewar and Selinger. Ontario under the infamous Bob Ray. And uh, also Nova Scotia under uh, Daryl Dexter. It's like, poor Nova Scotia, they often get forgotten. Like, no, we had an NDP government too. Um, so they were great because they were our, uh, our middle ground in the comparison. And also, by doing this comparison, not just looking at what had NDP governments done in the past, specifically on the topic of healthcare, but where can we situate the, the first three quarters of the Alberta NDP from 2015 onward? How do they compare to their NDP fellows? How do they compare to their own claims as a party or to their opponents' criticisms? Um, and how do they stack up against past governments we've had here in Alberta? So it's a big claim. It's a big, uh, a big undertaking, and uh, hence, the, hence the long time frame on this report. <laughs> All right. So the first thing that we found overall, and, and it, I think was to be expected, looking at our five NDP governments, and also our sixth, is very, very frequently, they came in with good intentions, uh, but under very bad timing, right? So um, in most of the uh, circumstances that we looked at, were that NDP governments were arriving on the scene in very challenging economic times, either globally or, or specific to their own province, Oftentimes, they were coming in, um, succeeding either progressive conservative or, uh, in the case of BC, social credit parties who had themselves run up large deficits 
In the case of Saskatchewan, there was a monumental corruption scandal that saw a third of the uh, PC governing caucus arrested. <laughs> right. Look into it, it was fascinating. Um, it tells you why there's not much of a PC party in Saskatchewan anymore. So in, in some, in the, the, the broad overtones of these uh, NDP governments in every situation from 1990 onward, was that they're entering at that moment, yes, when electorates are calling for change, but when electorates are faced with uh, change is already happening and we don't know how to control it or how to approach it. Um, so dealing with very challenging economic circumstances, not of their own making. But the, okay, uh, specifically to the Alberta NDP, I wanted to look at their approach to healthcare in these challenging economic times, in this difficult political situation that they were in as a, as a first-timer government, if you want to put it that way. Um, and I decided to sort of read that through five broad themes that they themselves have repeated quite frequently over the last three and a half years. Um, many, many of these will come either directly from Health Minister Sarah Hoffman, from Premier Notley, or from the party's 2015 um, election camp uh, platform. Uh, so the first is uh, this wonderful phrase we hear a lot on bending the cost curve, right? So it's a huge thing because the narrative that's been built up oh, over the last uh, decade at least is about the spiraling costs of healthcare in our province. There is some, some basis to that. Healthcare costs are going up everywhere. Um, our population is aging, it, right? There, there are factors to that that um, transcend provincial politics or provincial policy decisions. But also that um, the NDP here, governing a province that has had historically much higher um, rates of health spending um, by some measures than other provinces. Um, also the fact that under the, the Stelmac through the Redford administrations, healthcare budgets uh, were increasing at an average of 6% per year or more. Um, so, in some ways, the uh, not only NDP has been a lot more successful at controlling healthcare um, healthcare costs at the budget level. Um, over the last four budgets that they've presented, annual healthcare spending increases have averaged around three percent per year, which the opposition still likes to paint as astronomical growth, where in reality this is actually slightly less than the increase in inflation and population growth. Um, so in, in real terms, that's, that's slightly less dollar per person, per, uh, per service that needs to be applied. Okay. So I know you can't tell my wonderful uh, graph here is very skewed. This shows our six provinces that we considered, plus the Canadian average on um, actual um, healthcare spending per capita. Over, t over the time period that we examined. So you can definitely see Alberta way at the top, but not really following much different of a trajectory than, uh, than its provincial counterparts. Hey, the second theme that we've heard a lot since 2015 is building, not cutting. And uh, how many of you saw this initial, this is a, uh, a tweet from Sarah Hoffman, I can't play the video from here, but it shows a wonderful, explosive view of the Calgary General Hospital turning to dust and rubble. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and it's a, it's a recurrent theme. Um, and, and what we've seen particularly is that one of the biggest legacies uh, of the Klein era was the lack of investment in infrastructure and maintenance in, in key facilities, particularly in healthcare facilities. Um, so again, the Notley government came in uh, behind the eight ball on that one. So over uh, the course of the last three and a half years, they've initiated 21 major capital health projects um, and totaling about 5.5 billion. So some of those big ones that they like to, to um, 
point to the Calgary Cancer Centre, which ground has been broken on, the Royal Alexandra Hospital expansion, which is still in the design phase, the announcement of a new hospital for Southwest Edmonton in the coming years, um, and the replacement and expansion of the uh, emergency room at Edmonton's Misericordia Hospital. Now again, some of you might remember 2015, the call was not for an expanded ER at the Misericordia. Um, the NDP were campaigning very explicitly on a full re replacement level facility there on the West End. Um, and instead, what we've seen there has been very piecemeal um, attempts to sort of literally staunch the bleeding there. Uh, so they've received money to fix the elevators and stop the flooding. So that's good. That's a victory. Uh, so again, there, there are sort of these balances to be weighed up here. On the one hand, a very significant um, amount of investment going into, into new builds. Um, and so far, they, they certainly haven't blown any hospitals up themselves. Uh, so, that's, uh, so that's certainly a win. When we looked at our comparator NDP governments, it was actually quite a mixed bag in terms of, of um, hospital and other healthcare infrastructure, not a lot of building, and actually quite a lot of cutting and closures. And you're thinking in terms of the Saskatchewan government under Romano and their uh, 52 hospital closures there. So, so we always like to have a benchmark, and that's probably our low bar. If we don't cut 52 hospitals, we're doing well. So the third, um, the third one comes directly from the 2015 election campaign, which was ending costly experiments in privatization. Um, so again here, building on some of the, um, the perceived scandal uh, attached to the preferential access inquiry um, and the, the idea that um, private clinics and uh, were, were exploiting their ties to government, were exploiting their ties to other wealthy donors um, and allowing um, inequities of access based on ability to pay. So um, out of this sort of came a, a very clear commitment from the Notley NDP to, to prioritize public, uh, publicly funded, publicly delivered healthcare services and to roll back uh, some of that slippery slope to privatization that had been allowed under the previous PC governments. So the very first one, and, and possibly the most controversial at the time, was the cancellation of the Sonics uh, Labs contract. Yay, yes. <laughs> if you love a lab worker, give a shout. Um, at the <laughs> so but a part of this uh, was actually that there were um, significant problems in the request for tender and how the proposal uh, was selected. So um, as much as this was uh, hammered by critics as an ideological decision, in many ways it was the only decision that could be made um, given, given how poorly the entire process had been handled um, prior to Sarah Hoffman becoming the health minister. What she did next was actually taking that to, to I think, to uh, um, the, the NDP level, if we want to put it that way, I don't, um, in terms of the decision to consolidate lab services entirely under the province um, by 2022, I believe. Um, so that would mean technically buying out DynaLife and um, putting public infrastructure money into building the super lab facility here in Edmonton, rather than having that outsourced um, and, and owned by, uh, by these lab companies themselves. So, uh, on the one hand, it seems like a, a small corner of our healthcare system, but actually one that impacts on everyday life. And in terms of even my ability as a researcher to gain information about how lab services are billed, how they interact with private clinics or other uh, entities in the healthcare system, currently all of that is proprietary business information and there's, there's no transparency around it at the moment. So uh, for health policy nerds everywhere, that's also a win. Um, likewise, the cancellation of outsourced medical laundry services, right, bringing that back under, um, under public fund funding and delivery. 
And also very prominent was um, Hoffman's announcement of an audit of private membership clinics, specifically the Copeman Clinic, um, after a number of allegations were raised through a CBC investigation um, about uh, the, the exclusion of certain types of patients who were not able to pay the full membership fees. Um, now, while that was announced with much passion and vehemence in uh, 2016, there has actually been no public release of the findings at this point, um, and this researcher has had no luck uh, getting anyone to answer questions about that audit and whether any action has been taken. In the meantime, Copeman Clinics have actually been purchased by TELUS, so uh, that, oh yes. Uh, they purchased the parent company, which was called Medicis, which owns a, a range of private um, and quasi-private medical facilities across the country. So uh, watch for your friendly neighborhood TELUS person to sell you some diagnostic tests that you don't need. <laughs> My husband will kill me, he works for TELUS. <laughs> To learn a little bit more about this, uh, our report from um, 2017 called Blurred Lines goes extensively into the Copeman situation. Uh, finally, which is sort of, uh, I had trouble with this, the sort of, is it a win, is it not a win? In terms of long-term care beds, the pledge from the 2015 election platform was for 2,000 public long-term care beds. Um, and well, finally, at towards the end of their term, um, this government is close to meeting that 2,000 number. It's very much a technical exercise to determine whether those are actually considered public beds or not. For the most part, they are, of course, pub publicly funded out of the, uh, the health budget, but by and large, all of those new bed spaces are being delivered through private and um, not-for-profit sort of religious uh, facilities rather than through Alberta health facilities. Okay, so on to providing the right care in the right place at the right time by the right health professionals. Sarah Hoffman has a catchy speechwriter. She likes to use this one. Um, I'm thinking about this one in terms of, in terms of, um, what Heather referred to as expanding that, that Medicare umbrella, our public, our public health care coverage, and trying to think about not just holding the line on our current um, public health care system, but thinking about where, where we could be doing more, where we ought to be doing more. So I had to think pretty hard about this one. The, I think the biggest win from my personal uh, perspective was the increase in funding for midwifery care. Midwifery was brought under the Alberta Health Care Insurance Plan in 2009. Um, it runs under a very different model which, um, in which the funding actually caps the number of um, courses of care that can be delivered in any given year. So the number of women and families who can access midwifery services has a hard cap on it, um, which, is, which is predetermined by the budget. So this increase so between 2016 and 2019, 49 million additional dollars to allow for 400 more midwife assisted births. So that's a jump of 30% here in Alberta. And it may seem like a good chunk of change, 49 million. Um, the, um, Alberta um, Midwives Association has actually done research showing how much money we could save by, uh, by utilizing midwives more extensively for low-risk uh, births and pregnancies. So that's, that's a, a win, but also an opportunity to go further. Now, of course, again, as Heather has very extensively discussed here, the big missed opportunity has been on pharmacare. And no, I don't think anyone was expecting a Notley government to come in and plop a, a fully formed pharmacare package in our lap as Albertans, but we certainly didn't expect um, our health minister to, to completely disavow support at, at the uh, Premier's conference. So uh, the concept that we can't afford pharmacare without a pipeline has been a, a sort of constant refrain and I think a very large um, sort of disconnect between the NDP's 
traditional um, principled position and their current, um, their current practice. Again, also no move to expand uh, um, dental coverage, which compared to some of the other NDP governments we looked at, there were a few provinces that moved towards providing um, basic dental care for children. I think in Nova Scotia, it was um, for children up to the age of 13. Um, in Saskatchewan, dental care for children was actually one of the things cut under Roy Romano's administration. So it's not, um, it's not a new idea, but it's certainly one that hasn't gained any traction here during this current term. And in fact, the, the big hoopla around having a dental fee guide was mainly that, in that it, there's no binding um, obligation on dentists to even follow the guide or to publicize it or, or display it. Um, and finally, I, again, there was um, quite a lot of controversy around the um, closure of fertility services and related services from the Lois Hole Women's Hospital. Again, these were not publicly uh, insured um, services being provided to Alberta families, but they were being housed in, uh, in our public hospital and through, um, again, through doctors that were within the Medicare system. And those have all been now effectively outsourced to very expensive and very exclusive private fertility clinics here in, in Edmonton and Calgary. So that decision was effectively um, a loss of access for a lot of families and created a lot of uh, turmoil and, and increased wait lists for uh, people waiting for fertility services. So I had a few other things, but I'm closing out on my time. So. Uh, that was my, my, my final question, thinking in terms of where we can put Alberta's um, NDP in relation to its NDP colleagues across Canada. And how has it approached healthcare? It's simply been a case of holding the line and not causing the catastrophic damage that you know, occurred in other provinces or occurred here in Alberta under PCs, um, preserving the status quo, or is there space here to actually expand and, and to do better? And I like, after I'd put together the slides, I thought I really should have called this uh, the horses or unicorns question. Um, and the final thing, so our ultimate question was, how do, we cons how do we evaluate the NDP's claim to be the chief champions or defenders of, of public health care. And as, uh, this is Janet's uh, slide from this morning, if anyone was in that session. And what we've noticed is, you know, for the first time, as she said, for the first time in 15 years, health care has dropped from being a top of mind issue for the majority of Albertans to coming well behind pipelines, the economy, and jobs. Um, and part of this, I think, is very much a result, whether intended or not, of the NDP's own discursive shift. Because, as we saw in three slides ago, we were very clearly told, we can't have nice things like pharmacare without pipelines. We can't pay for our services. We can't have the level or quality of, of healthcare or education without attaching it to um, increased oil revenue. So in that sense, um, that's a little bit of an own goal for the NDP um, in a way of taking the focus off of what should be one of their bread and butter issues and placing it on <clears throat> a unicorn. Uh, so what is this sort of very, very broad um, comparison? What kind of insights might it give us into the possibilities for post-2019. Um, and I don't know. The first thing I can say is, is a quote from Joe Sisi, right? Had another government been in place, they would have drastically and extremely slashed the necessary supports Albertans need in healthcare and other services. Um, one thing that we did see, and it was one of the clearest correlations in our, um, in our study, was what happened after the NDP government's left office 
in all five other provinces. Um, now, in four of those five, the effects on the healthcare system were immediate and drastic and extreme. Um, whether that the incoming government was a, a PC government, or in BC's case, a Liberal government, or in Saskatchewan's case, uh, a Saskatchewan party government. So in, in all of those provinces, their first instincts as the new government on the right cuts, pathways to privatization, closures, adversarial um, engagements with healthcare unions, right, um, and, and deep cuts in the, in the full on, uh, in the overall budget spending. Um, Delisting of services, removing that from public healthcare coverage was another one. Um, in Nova Scotia, this wasn't as dramatic. The uh, Dexter NDP were followed by a Liberal government who claimed to also really deeply care about healthcare. Uh, we didn't see the massive cuts there, but what we did see was that the McNeil Liberals were um, just less able to meet any of their promises or pledges on, on the healthcare system, um, and certainly didn't increase their budget funding as much as uh, the Dexter NDP had there. Um, and certain issues, like say the children's dental coverage, became very much a political football between the NDP and the Liberals in Nova Scotia. NDP put it in, Liberals took it out, NDP campaigned on bringing it back, there were protests, the Liberals tried to bring it back. It, right, so the sense that we gathered from this was that in every case, provinces were worse off, regardless of how successful their NDP government had done on, on healthcare specifically, it always got worse. So there's a bit of optimism for you all, um, but you can also take that as, as positively as you might like. So uh, this is one of, my, one of my favorites here from the most reliable mainstream news source we have here in Canada, the esteemed Beaverton. Uh, you just don't remember Bob Ray lectures Ontario man who doesn't remember Mike Harris, <laughs> right? So um, indeed, hospital closures, nurses fired, billions cut from social services, and and a huge, huge impact on the quality of um, and reliability of services that people received there. So. The, um, the final line to this article, if anyone, was that the, the fictitious interviewee recommended that everyone vote for Doug Ford as a way of avoiding the tragedies of history. <clears throat> I'll let you think about that. So how will we protect and enhance Alberta's public health care in the future? Um, what we saw overwhelmingly across our case studies was that even in cases where the NDP governments did not live up to their title as defenders of, the, of public health care, where they did not work to maintain funding or to push the envelope and try to develop a very comprehensive um, health services for all. People did. So health care unions, health care professionals, uh, average citizens, advocacy groups, researchers, they were the people across multiple provinces, and we remember this lesson from Alberta here as well, they were the ones pushing for their governments to do more to, and to um, preserve what we value most about our healthcare system. And I think if we take anything away from that, regardless of who comes out ahead in the spring of 2019, is the importance of all of us holding that government to account and uh, making sure that no one backslides on any of the small gains that we've made in healthcare. Not a unicorn, just a horse. <laughs> Great. Thanks, everyone. Okay, while well, you're thinking of your questions, I, I just. Uh, uh, one point I w want to make, I think, uh, to add to your uh, case for pharmacare is that Canada spends way too much money on, uh, on drugs, uh, more than any other country uh, in the world except the U.S., and so there's immense savings to be 
uh, had by uh, 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 unified uh, uh, negotiating uh, uh, system. Okay, I'm, we'll turn over to the public. I just uh, would would ask that you be respectful of other audience members and keep your keep your comments uh, or questions brief and concise. I guess that's the first hand. Uh, yep. Can I just make a comment before people start okay. asking questions? Because something I, is really important that I didn't clarify. When I was saying that in terms of what's in legislation and the possibility of a deregulator, uh, you know, uh, massive deregulation, the difference that is important to point out is that pieces of legislation, acts, have to go through the legislature. Regulatory changes can occur simply by uh, order in council, the cabinet. So, you know, there is huge threats in terms of the amount of change that can occur without any debate in the legislature or even any public knowledge until after it is done. Or consultation. Or consultation. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh. Hi there, my name's uh, Mike Dempsey. We heard earlier about uh, the, the previous PC government held costs at uh, about 6% growth a year, and the NDP have done it at 3 Before we all pat ourselves on the back about the 3%, we need to remember that there are a number of contracts negotiated recently with zeros in them. Health Sciences, UNA, and AUP members. About 100,000 of our workers negotiated zeros in their contracts. And once again, it's mostly women in healthcare. And, uh, and this does nothing to advance pay equity in the province, that's for sure. But I think we need to recognize that this, this keeping at 3% is by a large segment of the population giving more than they should be giving is what I think. But, uh, you know, we, we <laughs> I don't think 3% is something to be necessarily admired because a lot of the people, the general support staff of AAP just accepted just a couple of days ago a contract and there's 23,000 of our members for zeros and on average they make 19 to $21 an hour. Thank you. But Can I have much to say to that? Well, um, that is true. <laughs> and um, healthcare workers like others uh, don't live in a vacuum, don't exist in a vacuum. I have to say that for a lot of healthcare workers, yes, there have been zeros, we've had zeros, but we've also uh, appreciated that we haven't had the austerity cuts that would have not only resulted, you know, in no pay increases, because in the Klein years, we, took, we actually had a, a, a wage rollback. It was never legislated, but it was agreed to. So we haven't had wage rollbacks, and we haven't had the massive destruction of the workforce that we had. So there are certainly, um, you know, payoffs, or, or there's certainly uh, differences. The other thing that for healthcare workers specifically, at least those working in hospitals um, and in um, facilities that uh, where they, well, hospitals, because that's uh, in terms of the our pension plan. Uh, we have had our pension plan uh, not only protected from the kind of activities that would have gone on uh, had the previous government uh, wanted to continue, and which we know uh, that man who likes uh, deregulation wants to attack. But again, we've had, under this government, we have not only had our pension plans protected, but uh, early next week we expect to have our pension plans given to us, a 28-year promise to give control of our pension plans to the workers and, the, and uh, their employers. So yes, there have been trade-offs. It hasn't been all good, but at least we can say that there hasn't been the kind of decimation we saw in the 90s. Hello, thank you for, for your presentations. And uh, yes, I thank you for saying that, Heather, because it kind of goes in with what I wanted to say. Um, my name is Yvonne Whiting. I'm with Health Sciences Association of Alberta. Uh, in this last three and a half years that the Notley government has been in, for the first time in my long career, about the same time as Heather's, um, 
it felt like we were actually getting some gains in healthcare for the first time in a long, long time, rather than trying to defend what we had. And that felt really good. Um, is it perfect? No. We know about the long-term beds and, and all that. Um, but even stopping, starting off by stopping those cutbacks was a real relief, yeah. especially if you've been hit yeah. by those mid-90s. So they, they, they were horrible, horrible years to live in. Um, and they did, they did add some wonderful gains, as, as uh, you mentioned, Rebecca. But one that I wanted to add on there that I didn't see you put, and I, I think is a very big health benefit for Alberta is the safe injection sites that have gone up. Like those are huge um, for for health health care. Yeah. And um, I, I'm going to try to make this positive because uh, at the latest NDP convention just last month, I was, and it, which was supposed to kind of be the kickoff for the election, I was hearing a lot more about healthcare and education and not just pipelines and economy. Now maybe because it was of the crowd, but if those topics are the only thing that the public's talking about, that's not all I heard at that convention. And so we need everybody to come together and make sure that we, uh, we let the public know and that you all believe that um, health matters, okay? Thanks. Yeah, just a comment in terms of I think that there is certainly um, uh, frustration at that, and certainly around long-term care beds and commitments there in particular, that we haven't had the kind of progress um, that we would like to see. Uh, we have had some important um, uh, pullbacks from privatization versus what we would expect to see uh, under a different government, which is a massive move uh, to privatization, which we would have to fight against again. But another positive that I think is important uh, for Alberta and hopefully will be done nationally is the prohibition on pay for plasma. I believe we were only the second or third province to actually adopt that. So, yeah, in the, it, yeah. So. Somebody from this side of the room. Oh, okay. Simple question. I managed to miss uh, the. Let's uh, keep keep it short, please. I managed to miss uh, the title of the report that compares the various NDP governments. Could we have that again, please? Sure. No, that's that's my bad because uh, we we haven't re released it yet. Um, it's expected out by sort of the middle of December. Um, our working title is called Alberta in Context, um, NDP Government's Record on Healthcare Across Five Provinces, subtitle, colon, subtitle. But, so keep a lookout for it on um, the Parkland website over the next probably six weeks. And uh, fingers crossed it all goes smoothly. And, uh, but once that's released, it's um, available free for download. You can read the entire report. Thanks. Hi, I guess I'm over here. <laughs> uh, two things, thank you to you both, and thank you, Heather, for all the years that you've put in, in support of our health care and for seniors. And uh, I had a question, Rebecca. You mentioned the Kochman Clinic. Uh, I think people might be um, not aware of the fact that in Calgary there's several more that make the Kochman look very cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, they ask $3,000 a year in membership uh, per person. And uh, I'm wondering if anybody's doing a study on that. Uh, you did mention something, I didn't catch the name of something in 2017 that you did. Yeah, my report for Parkland was called Blurred Lines. Um, it came out um, a year ago. So we did look extensively at, um, at any of the private membership clinics that we could positively identify in Alberta. Um, so we do, we do cover, I think, uh, five or six of the the main culprits, if you want to categorize them that way. Um, what we were trying to do with that report was to, to even establish a baseline of just how extensive um, this network of clinics is, who owns them, who's supporting them, where are they finding these loopholes um, in which to operate. Um, and as you might find, if you, if you do pick that up, um, even getting any of that information was incredibly difficult. So. Uh, yeah, not a lot of transparency still 
on that issue of, of private membership clinics. But yes, the report's called Blurred Lines. That then, um, and I've asked the, um, uh, the uh, CPSA, the College of Physicians and Surgeons, and then if anybody's keeping track of where the doctors spend their time, uh, because I believe citizens are paying their malpractice insurance, yeah. and as such then we have a right to know if they're 10% in public and 90% in private doing Botex and things like that. Yeah. It might be a research. Thank you. Um, and just to speak to that point, what we based the report on um, were um, freedom of information requests of, of the actual audit files of those clinics that had been conducted sort of between 2011 to 2014. Um, they did mention in those files um, the breakdown of, of public versus private um, services being provided by the physicians in those facilities. Um, unfortunately for us, they were completely redacted as proprietary business information. Um, so what was said in one of the auditor's comments, um, which wasn't redacted, was, well, frankly, if this is, if this is the breakdown blank, um, the only thing I can say to that is these clients aren't really getting very good value for money but I guess that's buyer beware. So that was, that was very much a, a direct quote. Yeah. No. yeah, I think, Verna, what you're raising is if they're spending 90% of their time in the private sector side, private service side, uh, we're paying 100%, collectively we're paying 100% of the malpractice insurance. Yes? It's part of their fee, it's part of the agreement. Hello, thank you, uh, it's right. good, uh, uh, good speaking. Um, my question to you is, is not so much a question as a affirmation of the NDP in terms of uh, labor legislation with regards to OH&S. Yeah. Uh, I sit on the, um, for a major utility company in Calgary on the Joint Workers uh, Committee, currently in the fight to be the co-chair but I got my union support mm -hmm. on that. Uh, but that, uh, that would help reduce, uh, uh, in terms of occupational uh, incidences uh, with regards across all, uh, all industries in, Al in Alberta. Yeah, the other thing that uh, indirectly has benefited not just healthcare workers, but all workers, are changes to the employment standards, uh, the Labor Relations Code, uh, certainly uh, Occupational Health and Safety, but also WCB, particularly um, in terms of the, the employment standards uh, for workers who are not in unionized environments who now have assured access to certain kinds of, of leaves where including sick leave, where the previously they may have been in, uh, simply lost their employment entirely because of, of uh, needing a leave and that kind of stuff. So those, again, are indirect benefits to, I would say, to healthcare workers in terms of stuff, yeah. We have time for one more question. Oh, hi, my name is Barrett. Uh, I think I have an interesting question in the sense that it, it tries to tie together both of your your papers because I think what you've had us consider, which is very interesting, is the sort of big ideas in healthcare, say pharmacare, rooting out privatization, you know, labs, all the all these things. At the same time, dealing with the electoral dimension of it all, and so I think thinking about those two things together is quite productive. So, I guess my my question is for you, Heather, is around pharmacare and your your optimism around the timeline. Mm -hmm. Just wondering if you could comment a little bit on on the extent to which you think the Liberals can pull this off in the sense that obviously if Andrew Scheer gets in, that's not gonna happen. So yeah. you're kind of banking on the Liberals there. And so just wondering, because electoral reform, they weren't able to deliver on some of these big ideas, right? So to what extent do you have faith that, that, that the Trudeau Liberals can yeah, do Yeah, I think in electoral reform, they had their own reasons um, for not fulfilling that. The overwhelming uh, public support for a, a national, for a pharmacare program is what gives, it gives me hope. And I mean, it's been a, a talked about for a lot of years, but never with the, the kind of 
level of public engagement and support that currently exists. I think it's going to be a big a part of the Liberal platform. It's not going to come into effect, obviously, before uh, the election, but I think that's going to be a big part of their promise, and it is deliverable. I mean, if, if the stats from uh, the down the drain, which is, was 2016, are correct, um, we as a province, because they calculated, you know, uh, how many billion a year, uh, 17 million a day. Um, I believe Alberta would be losing about 1.5 million, uh, unnecessarily spending about 1.5 million. So I think the fact, the amount of, of public support that is finally pushing this, um, and especially if we can get uh, employers um, business on side in terms of how much a windfall this would really be for them in terms of a competitive edge, uh, particularly when there's the concerns about being competitive with the Americans, with the kinds of uh, tax changes they are making. I mean, I think that we have a whole bunch of reasons that can be sold to different uh, constituencies uh, well, not doesn't need to be sold. The different constituencies can embrace that will uh, give the the liberals the courage to not only make it a big part of their promise, but to actually fulfill it. Okay, um, we have a uh, uh, high quality but fiscally responsible <laughs> gift for uh, each of you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. So I'm supposed to uh, remind you that uh, oh, I'm supposed to remind you that um, you are you should uh, put your uh, plastic mugs in in the bins provided uh, and please fill out your conference uh, evaluation uh, forms that are on the table in in front. And uh, don't forget that after the next session, there's a social uh, event in the, at 5.30 in the Student Union building on the seventh floor. If you don't know where to go, just follow the crowd.